back to another session of GCAN, GAN Current Affairs and News Analysis. So today we will be discussing about seven important topics from today's article. We have first the India-Canada relationships. In my last class, I gave you a glimpse of what is happening between India and Canada. Where in this, we have to actually discuss some of the updates related to it as well. Then we have the Women's Reservation Bill. In totally, we will be dealing about how the history of Women's Reservation Bill has been happening. The arguments favoring the bill and arguments against the bill and what all amendments have been actually made. Till now, the Women's Reservation Bill has been actually passed by the Lok Sabha as well as the Rajya Sabha. And now, it is actually awaiting the assent of the President. Now, then we have the rise in global debts. Now, you know the global debts has been actually increasing. From the reports presented by IIF, we will be actually dealing about how much the debt has increased from which all countries and how it is actually a grave concern all over the globe. Then we have the Maharashtra FRMS. It is actually relating to GST, environment and ecology. You should know the definition or the meaning about the FRMS. Then we have the IBSA meeting, IBSA here, I stands for India, B stands for Brazil and South SA stands for South Africa. So we will be dealing with this tripartite IBSA meeting in detail. Then we have the Norman Bloke Award, it is a science field award and then Karobali, Moscow Valley and Guzur Valley, this is in actually Jammu and Kashmir, Union Territory Jammu and Kashmir. So we will be dealing about all these topics today. So in the first I have told you about the India Canada relationships. If you are looking for a story backwards, the first thing is the killing of Hardeep Singh Nijar. He is actually the chief of the Khalistan Tiger Force. So with this, there was actually a lot of incidents that is happening between India and Canada of general. In the way forward, it was uh, like a state that the Canada actually ex expelled our raw chief and India in retaliation also expelled the chiefs of Canada from India. Then there was actually suspension of the visas and also India called Canada as a safe haven for terrorists. We know that uh, Khalistan Tiger Force is actually a terrorist group under UAPA. So that is how the story has been going on and this has affected the India-Canada relationships at the highest peak available. It has even suspended all the FTA, free trade agreement talks that has actually come about. So that is the story so far. So the root of India-Canada tension as you know is the Khalistan issue. Where Canada has been stating the Khalistan Tiger Force as activists and not terrorists. So that is where all the root cause has lied. Since the 1960s and 1970s there is actually a little bit of uh, what partiality towards the Sikh, the Sikh diaspora particularly in Canada. Leading to the movements of the Khalistan issues over the decades where the Canada has not taken any of India's pleas seriously. And then like we can actually state one example is that India has actually requested the extermination of a terrorist called Tal Talvinder Singh Palmer in 1982 where this Canada has actually rejected this claim by India to actually name this person as terrorist or excavate this person. But in 1985, in last class I have told you about the Air India flight where it was actually bombed and led to the death of about 300 passengers. And this was actually the mastermind before be, uh, behind this attack is actually Palmer. So India has actually claimed Canada, but Canada has actually rejected it and it led to the death of about 300 person due to the mastermind Palmer behind this bombing. So you can actually write this as one of the grave examples. Now, what evidence does Canada have related to the Nijar killing? So recently till now, the Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has not released any kind of evidence supporting like Indian has actually claimed killing of the Nijar. But the Canada has actually released some kind of report to the 5I. So 5I, the 5I countries, 5I countries that the US, UK, Canada, Australia and New Zealand. Now this group was actually created post World War II. So these are the five I countries, US, UK, Canada, Australia and New Zealand. So Canada has released really some kind of claims so or shared some kind of claims with these five I countries. But in globally they have not released any kind of accusation against India yet. If that is released it will be against Canada's sovereignty and has international like it will be actually violation of the international rule of law and India can face certain repercussions. So that is what is there. Now there are certain sources that Canada claim like the signal that is the signal and the human intelligence. Signal intelligence and human intelligence which claim that there were certain kind of communications happening between the Indian High Commissioner and that counterparts in India. So because of which there is actually some claims that India might have killed this Nijar, the KTF. 
chief as well. But the thing is that none of the five I countries has actually backed Canada's claims. But this was not the case in case of Russia. In uh, a few years back, British has actually claimed that Russian, some of the Russian officials was killed in the British soil. So because of which all the five I countries has actually dismissed the Russian officials that was present in their individual countries. But these five I countries are not taking certain stances in the case of India because India is a formidable partner for all these five I countries. But USA has actually claimed that India, like the USA won't actually give any kind of special treatment in the case of India. But now this is all against this Western double standards. You can see the USA has killed Osama bin Laden in Pakistan. It has actually killed Iran, Iranian General Soleimani in Iraq. So USA was able to actually do this kind of activities in another soil and they actually take credit for killing some of the terrorists. But India when they actually take, if India had taken a chance to kill Niger, then the western countries are taking a double standards against India. So that is also pointed in this article. So in this you have to Mainly you have to focus on the 5 I countries as I have told you about the US, UK, Canada, Australia as well as New Zealand. So that is one of the highlights and you can actually quote some of like if a country case comes in case of India, Canada relationship, you might get a main topic because the, the relations have been deteriorating so far. In the next year you may get one. So you can actually quote out some of these points in it also. Now moving on we have the women's reservation bill. So talking about as I have told you the women reservation bill, about 33 percentage of reservations will be given for women in the case of Lok Sabha as well as the state legislative assembly. It also talks about reservations for the scheduled caste and scheduled tribes of women as well in, in this 33 percentage quota. So to make this there were certain amendments that was actually made. There was amendment like few articles was actually added the 330A which you can see for the Lok Sabha, for, uh, uh, reservations in the Lok Sabha, the 332A, reservations in the state legislative assembly. Then we have the 334A, which actually talks about a 15 years, as I have told you, this pers a particular reservation is actually for 15 years. In after 15 years, if there is a continued reservation needed, then, then the parliamentary committee will make certain amendments to this act again to actually increase the reservations. So as per article 334A, the reservation is presently for 15 years. Then certain amendments like all these three articles were added, 330A, 332A and 334A were added, whereas certain amendments was actually made in the 239AA, which deals about the Delhi Legislative Assembly and certain was actually put reservations or uh, 33 percent reservation for one in the Delhi Legislative Assembly. There is separate act because Delhi is a union territory which has a legislative assembly. Now only uh, like two union territories like Delhi and Puducherry has certain kind of legislative assembly. So there is another article called the 239AA. Now presently there are about, about 82 MPs in Lok Sabha. Now with this uh, reservation this 82 MPs then um, can actually increase to about 100 81 MP. So that is what the story so far has been. But the opposition has pointed out some kind of issues with this. The first thing is that the delimitation, the reservation will only come into view after the delimitation has been conducted. And another thing is that there is no reservation present for the OBCs moment. So in the last class I have told you that this uh, reservation won't be coming in the 2024 general election. This won't actually come in the 2024 general election as because this particular reservation has been linked with the delimitation commission. So this delimitation will come only in 2026. So the reservation has to come in, it will only come in 2029. There is actually a 5 to 6 years gap till the implementation of the reservation will actually come please. The problem is that the part, uh, the government has actually linked this reservation with the delimitation. If this was not linked then since 2024 itself the reservation might have actually come in effect. The thing is that what is, you need to first know what is delimitation. Delimitation is actually adjusting or readjusting the territorial limits and also increasing the number of seats in the Lok Sabha as well as the state legislative assemblies. But this last delimitation was actually held in 2008 and since then no delimit delimitation was actually conducted. As per article 82 which deals about delimitation, the parliament actually amended this article 82 add to stating that the next delimitation will be happening in 2026 only. So which means that if this um, uh, delimitation comes in 2026 only, the proposition are stating that this 
like implemented uh, this this will delay the implementation till 2031 and not 2029 because an act has to come a committee has to come a delimitation commission has to come like these things will actually take a lot of time and it will further delay the implementation till uh, 2031 but the present government has stated that no such delay will be actually made after the 2024 election cesar they will be pertaining to a committee and they will be conducting the delimitations and then the reservations will come into effect much more early and not it won't be extended till 2031 so these are the claims that the government has actually made as per told you the another issue is that there is no reservation within the 33 percentage for the obc quotas for the uh, scheduled caste and the scheduled tribes there is quotas but not for the obc class so these are the two issues that has been actually mentioned by the opposition now let us look into the history of such reservation for a long like since 1955 there has been actually uh, talks going on for the reservation of women and till now only in 2023 such reservation has been actually successfully passed by both the lok sabha and the rajya sabha so if you are looking the history if you talk about 1931 a memorandum by the women's leader has been actually made for that like men and women are equally eligible to contest like and vote and contest in election without any sex discrimination so that has been actually mentioned in the 1931 memorandum of women so if, like particularly after independence such initiative starting only in 1955 where the government actually appointed a committee to recommend 10 percentage women's reservation initially it was only 10 percentage but no such it was not actually in lok sabha and in state assemblies Then in 1988, the National Perspective Plan for Women, which actually recommended about 30 percentage of reservation for women in 1998, 1988 by the National Perspective Plan for Women. In 1993, 33 percentage of reservation in local bodies was recommended. Now this is actually a breakthrough by the 73rd and 74th. constitutional amendment act which talks about a 33 percent reservation in the panchayat and the local bodies now that was the first such big breakthrough in the local level for the representation of women then in 1996 the women reservation bill was actually introduced again it was actually the 81st constitutional amendment bill it talks about a 30 percent reservation in lok sabha and state assemblies but this was actually the bill was lapsed and it was actually not passed by the lok sabha then we have the 1998 where the bajpai government again passed but this bill was again lapsed then it was reintroduced a lot of times in 1999 2000 2002 2003 and all these years the bill was actually not passed again in 2010 the bill was again reintroduced in rajya sabha but it got in rajya sabha it was passed but it got lapsed in lok sabha so because of which like all these years we have been actually trying to reintroduce and pass this women's bill like finally in september 2023 we were able to actually pass in both the house of the parliament and now it's actually waiting the assent of the president so certain arguments have been based up uh, based on the is favoring the bill the first thing is that the global gender gap report of 2022 actually states that india is at the rank of 48 among about 146 countries you might feel that we are at 48 means it is a good but the thing is that comparing to our neighbors like nepal bangladesh sri lanka pakistan this 48th rank is pretty much low they are actually ranked higher than india in the case of global gender gap report in 2022 Then, compared to the number of women voters in India, a, uh, like about forty-eight percentage of the women actually vote. But the thing is that in in the last class I have told you about only fifteen percentage, a uh, close to about fourteen point nine two percentage of women in present Lok Sabha. This is pretty much less than ten percentage. Like more than twenty states in India has women, ten percentage women in the case of state. assemblies so that is how is what we have a lot of women voters but the, the but the percentage of women in elected or in the parliament or in the state assemblies is pretty much very less like the best example you can actually quote is that in 2019 lok sabha elections less than 9 percentage of the fielded members were actually women so that is one of the prime example another thing we can actually quote that women who actually got the chance at the local government level have done exemplary work women who has been elected in the panchayat and the local bodies have taken issues that actually 
helps in combating the problems of women as well. And this has actually, they have, the woman has done an exemplary work in the case of panchayat and local bodies. So that is what is actually terrible. Women, if elected, they will address the problems and concerns of the woman more. Like we talked about the marital tree, which is still not actually accomplished. So certain things like that could actually come in force if women actually get a chance to get elected. Then there are some arguments against the bill as well. Women benefit only, like might benefit only certain sector of women who are actually rich, who has actually political background or such. That is posed as one of the arguments. Then repeat of the Sarpanch Pati. Now this is actually very like very important that you know what is the Sarpanch Pati. In the games of Panchayat and local bodies, uh, when there was a reservation, like 33 percentage reservation reserved for women, so the number of seats for male actually reduces. So what they do is that from this woman's seat, they let their wife contest. The serpent actually lets their wife contest and all the decision will be taken uh, taken based on him and not based on the wife. So this is called the Sarpanch Pati. Even if the wife is selected, from behind the wife, all the decisions will be taken by the husband. So that is called the Sarpanch Pati phenomena. Then we have the political partner should have taken the initiated give tickets. The thing is that the first thing should be taken by the political parties and not based on the reservation alone. A certain steps to represent the woman in election should be taken by the political parties. If that is not taken, even if we have reservations, it is not going to Work. The political parties have to take decisions so that they could actually give up space for the woman. Then no such reservation in the parliament is actually needed. So that is some of the arguments for and against the bill that has been mentioned. Now moving on we have the global debt. The first thing is I will give you two data which has been released by the Institute of International Finances which actually quote the global debt amount. They state that as per like the global debt has actually risen, risen in the last decade by about 100 trillion. Now the global debt is about 307 trillion dollars. That is the global debt. In the last one decade alone, this debt has increased by 100 trillion and now it is standing at 307 trillion. If you are looking at the share of GDP wise, it is actually close to 336 percentage. That is where the global debt stands in the share of GDP. So you see, in the last one years, especially after COVID time, this global debt has been actually increasing. The first thing is, what is global debt? You might feel that the global debt is just related to the governments alone. But no, it's a overall taken by the government, the private sector, as well as the individual. So what is a government? That is a global debt relating the government, private and individual. So what are the, ex uh, why is there? There is debt within the part of government. Government has to borrow money so that they can actually meet the expenditure. When all the revenue, the direct tax, ind indirect tax and other revenues from the PSUs are actually not enough to meet the expenditure, the government is actually forced to borrow money. So that is the one condition where the government will borrow money. Another thing is that to actually pay off the interest rate in the uh, loans which has been taken previously. For to manage that, the government actually take up or borrows. Then why does the private business borrow? The thing is that the private business borrow to invest. They borrow the money, then invest, then actually pay back the uh, pay back the invest. In media, they will actually gain the profit or interest. So that is why the private business actually borrows. Then the individuals, we might need car loans, we need home loans, we need scholarships and such. So because student loans and such, so because of which an individual will also borrow. All these borrowings by the government, the private and the individual close together to come to global now. Now presently the global debt is about three, uh, $307 trillion, which is the share of GDP, 336 percentage. So why is it rising? The global debt has been actually rising, but in the meantime, in between the COVID, this debt has actually reduced because there was no such economic activity that has been going on. But after the COVID, when the economic activities resumed, there was actually high pitch regarding the increase of these debts. Close to 80% rise is, rise is based mainly upon this developed economies like US, UK, France and Japan. And India, China, Brazil's kind of countries are not far behind. We are also the emerging market countries where we have contributed a lot in the rise of this global debt. By the first half of 2023, like till uh, June itself, our global debt has actually risen by 10 trillion dollars. So that is how the global debt has been rising. You need to know all, uh, you need to know this uh, to 336 percentage and 307 trillion dollars, the global debt. Then you need to know what is global debt and what is the condition, how it has been rising. 
So if you are looking more into this, why is it rising? The first thing is that monetary expansion. The thing is that debt level has been rising over the years. Since all the years the bank has been giving out money because it has been giving out money and sustaining the inflation because the economy has to run. So by the monetary in, uh, expansion itself there has been rising global debt over the years. And even if we are actually doing some simple saving scheme like we are going to save in the bank. So if there is saving within the bank, the banks will be actually giving out loans. So because of which the economy economy can actually cause a rise in debt levels but these are not the main concerns here because these debt levels has been growing it has been consistent and it has been actually able to manage the inflation level as well what the concern is about the rise seen despite an increase in the interest rate so when government or the banks what the central banks want to manage the inflation what they will do they will actually rise the interest rate so when the interest rates increases if, let's say it was four percentage they increase the interest rate to six percentage so the amount of people who actually take loans will actually come down but the problem what happened here is that despite there is an increase in the interest rate the debt levels are actually not coming down so that is one of the major concerns that the author has actually mentioned in this article it has led to an increase in the debt levels even if there is actually an increase in the interest rate when the increase rate in interest rate increases the amount of loan should taken loan should reduce and the debt level should actually reduce but that is not happening in this case but if you are looking in the last seven quarters there has been actually a decline so what is that decline the first thing is there was reduction in the economic activity due to the covid level times and also the inflation away of debt by the government that particularly means that the government is actually printing money to pay off the debt so it says that there is a lot of debt that has been made by the government the government is actually printing additional money so that they can actually give pay off this external debt now this actually creates excess money in the market within that economy now this burdens the Customer, this burdens the private sector, it burdens all the people because there is excess money within the society and it actually increases the inflation. So that is some of the things that has been actually mentioned by the author. So if you are looking, concerns due to high amount of loan. The first thing is debt sustainability. Now if you have taken a lot of loans. Now if you are not able to pay back the loan, maybe you are not getting that enough money to actually pay back the loan. So what do you do? You take another loan so that you can actually pay back, pay back the first loan you have taken. So this cycle actually continues. Now this creates creates debt sustainability. So that is one of the high amounts of loan rates that is coming. Then the other thing is the central banks across the world have been increasing their interest rate. Earlier the interest rate was actually 10 percentage. Now they have actually increased it to about 20 percentage which means that the amount of money you have to pay back is also increasing. This actually increases the debt burden over the government. Also rising private debt is also a cause of economic concerns. Now if you are looking the non-fungible tokens. Now this was actually pretty much booming. This sector was actually pretty much booming. All the private was actually uh, like investing in this and all. But at a certain point came where the NFTs are actually not a global demand anymore and all uh, and because of which there was actually an economic crisis where the prices fell down to uh, fell down to at least one or two rupees only for this NFTs. It was actually about making about millions of dollars but then it came down to pretty much lower amounts. So when there is actually increase in activities especially in the private sector there is constant booming but a particular point comes place where then it may lead to an economic crisis. You can talk about the 2008 financial crisis. This that was something that happened in the similar lines. So what is the public debt and India status? The World Economic Forum warned in the start of 2023 that the rising public uh, there will be actually rising public debt all across the world due to two reasons the first thing is the fiscal stimuli for business by the government post pandemic the thing is that all the business has been closed down so for the revival of the economy the government has to give out some of the subsidies freebies and such so that the economy can revive such fiscal stimuli will actually lead to global public debt another thing is rising interest rate to manage inflation so when when there is rising interest rate still there is actually increase in burden over the government debt increases due to the rise in the interest rate even if 
they have not taken any new loans as I have told you 10 percentage, 12 percentage that has been increased in the interest rate. Now this increased the burden of the government to repay much more money. If you have taken 10 lakhs, there was an interest rate of only 10 percentage. You will have to pay back only 11 lakhs. But with the increase in the interest rate like 20 percentage, the amount you have to pay back will be like 12 lakhs instead of 11 lakhs. So there is increased burden. So if you are looking all over like Let's show you a start while you're looking over. The stand of India is considerably okay. It's sustainable. So if you're looking at the total debt of countries, India's debt lies at about 170 percentage. This is okay when you are comparing to the debt levels of other countries. So you're looking USA, the debt level is about 264 percentage. UK, 257 percentage. France, 345 percentage. The highest with the Japan closing to about 426 percentage. Comparing this 426 to that of India, India is particularly safer or this is more sustainable. Now this is actually close to the global average is about 336 percentage, whereas India stands only at 170 percentage. Now if you are looking at the internal debts, now we like the taking, we have the household, the private, the government. The household has taken only 36 percentage of total debt which is actually compared to the global of 62 percentage. The private 88 percentage compared to the global average of about 160 percentage. Indian government about 82 percentage compared to the total average. So that is how the total debt has been missing. So India is considerably in much more sustainable and safer position. Whereas the public debt of India is about 84 percentage of the GDP. This is sustained, this is high but sustainable like because even if the uh, economy is growing, this is much more sustainable. But the government should ensure that they don't give any of freebies or subsidies or such or else this kind of debt will be much more increasing and then it will become unsustainable. So as per the quarter one report of financial year 24, the growth rate of India was about 7.8 percentage in real terms and 8 percentage in nominal terms, which actually shows that despite all this, the GDP is actually still growing. So that is what we are dealing about this global debt condition all over the globe and particularly in India. Now we will be moving into the prelim section, we have the Maharashtra's FMLs. So this FMLs are basically short lived plants. Now these plants will be leaving in certain, certain cycles only. They grow during, uh, during their favorable season. So if you are looking at the annual, there are three types, annual, perennial as well as the monsoon. So this annual FMLs will be actually growing in a particular season only. They might need certain moisture condition to grow. So these plants will be growing and when the season ends, they will actually give out seeds and then this plants die. So in annually the next season comes particularly when this actually favorable again. The seeds which has been generated by the earlier plants will grow. Then when that season ends, they, this new plants will actually give out another seeds and then the plants die. So in this there is actually generation of plants coming. The same plant is not actually continuing the cycle. The plant before it dies, it gives out seeds. And next favorable condition comes, the seed grows into your plants. So certain kind of short lived plants are called Affirmance. So if you are looking at perennial performance, now all for all this, this requires a favorable condition. Now it requires a kind of bulb, a kind of bulb of plants like it may be potato, onion and such. So this bulb will be actually present in the ground. So when the favorable condition actually comes, it will grow leaves and roots. So at a certain point after this reduction of, after this favorable condition has gone, this plants and roots die whereas the bulb continues for the next season of uh, peripheral ephemeral. So that is this. Then there is monsoon ephemeral. Now this actually grows in particular season. Now if this actually starts growing in the end of May. Then it falls for June, July, August till there is an end of monsoon. So this particular kind of plants leaves through this monsoon season. So if you are looking particularly in examples, we have orchids, lilies, wild yams, Indian skulls and such in the case of Maharashtra. So that is called the ephemerals. So this key term is actually pretty much important in case of your films. Well, in each class we have been discussing our certain terminology. We have green nut just like such. We discussed in last class. So these certain terminologies are very important for you. Then we have the IBSA meeting. As I have told you, India, Brazil and 
South Africa. So they they actually met along with the 78th meeting. There was 78th meeting of the UN General Assembly. UN General Assembly. We talked about UN Climate Action Summit that took place along with the UNGA. So this IPSA meeting also took place parallel to the UNGA, and they actually released their joint statements. But thing is that they have to meet separately. So the all the three leaders, the tripartite leaders, will be meeting at the first quarter of next year. 2024. That's the first. Then they release certain joint statements. If regarding, like they are affirming the support and they are actually portraying the voice for the global south. So that is the main aim of IBSA. They are acting as the voice for the entire global south countries. They also actually took forth some statements for the peace, a peaceful resolution of the Ukraine war. Peaceful resolution of the Ukraine war. And they are also talking about certain kinds of reforms with the UN. Uh, they are actually talking about UN reforms and also push for adaptation of comprehensive convention on international terrorism, terrorism then sanctions as well as the reforms for the World Bank and the IMF. The UN reform is that they are actually frustrated with the paral frustrated with the parallels of intergovernmental negotiation within the UNSC and they want the UNSC to be expanded temporarily and permanent members should also be expanded in the case of UNSC, which is actually very outdated currently. And also then a push for the adoption of comprehensive like convention on international terrorism because terrorism has been increasing and because of all this Khalistan issue, India is pushing for much more bigger conventions based on the terrorism. And they have also reaffirmed that UNSC, the United Nations uh, uh, Security Council should have the sole authority to give out sanctions. Now against Russia a lot of countries have been giving out sanctions especially the western countries like EU, um, Europe and USA. So the, we are actually reaffirming that only UNSC should be actually giving out certain sanctions. So this actually goes against like it's most like we are supporting Russia. The, Russia is also a part of UNSC. So it's kind of we are supporting Russia on this. Then reforms on World Bank and IMF. The thing is that they were, um, thing is that all these countries like the developed countries has not actually met their target of giving 100 billion dollars every year by 2030. So that was also criticized by this meeting. So to know a little bit about the IBSA, now this actually came forward via the Brasilia declaration. This form, it formalized and named the IBSA dialogue from where the foreign ministers of the countries actually met in Brazil and they jointly gave out the Brasilia declaration in 2003. Since then this, act, this committee has actually met for five times and the last time they met is actually at 2011. Since then this committee is inactive and this meeting is this year only. They also actually fund the developed or developing countries uh, uh, for mainly for facilitating poverty and hunger reduction. You know Brazil has been actually targeting the poverty elevation of South uh, their country. So Brazil especially has been actually focusing on poverty and hunger elevation. And also they have been giving out IBSA fellowship program to help the young students and such. This was launched in 2016. So IBSA, India, Brazil and South Africa. They have been meeting after 2011. Then we have the Norman Bolang Award. This is actually a science field award and uh, this is the third such Indian agricultural scientist who is actually getting the award that is Swati Naik. Now the thing is that Swati Naik and a team actually formulated a strategy to make drought resistant rice varieties particularly is the native uh, Shabazi Dan rice variety of Odisha. So they were actually trying to formulate a strategy to introduce drought tolerant rice varieties. Now this particular award is presented every October by the World Food Prize Foundation and this is actually nicknamed as the Nobel Prize in Food and Agriculture because even Nobel Prize is released at this time period, it is also nicknamed as the Nobel Prize in Food Agriculture. Now it actually recognizes exceptional science based achievement and all the individuals should be below the age of 40 years. So that is what the Norman Bola award is about. She is the third such Indian agricultural scientist to get this award. Moving on to the last topic we have the Kabali Gali, Muskon Valley and Guris Valley. Now all this is in the Jammu and Kashmir region. You have the Guris Valley, Kaubali Valley and the Muskon Valley. Now this valley, now this Kaubali Gali actually, it's actually a mountain pass which is at the height of about 416 meter close to about 4000 meters at height and now this mountain pass actually connects the two valleys Mushkon valley and Gursan valley okay now but this valleys has been this mountain pass was actually closed because these were the sites of 
1999 Kargil War and the stand, uh, standoff, uh, standoff that was ceasefire standoff that was actually made between the India and Pakistan. And recently only the Indian government is actually allowing the passage through this mountain valley. The Muskon Valley is in actually the Kargil Dras sector as I have told you this was the site of the 1999 Kargil War. This has lush meadows with wild tulips and this Muskon Valley is actually home to endangered Himalayan view. The Gur Gursi Valley is actually at the uh, Badipur district of Jammu and Kashmir Union Territory. Now this was also closed for civilians. Both these valleys are opened up through connecting via the Kaboli Gali mountain pass. Main feature of the Gurus' Valley is that you won't find any houses made of concrete. Every house is actually made up of logs and such. And this valley is home to ibex, musk deer and marmots. So please like if you are seeing the words like such animal species, go and check the internet as well so that you will actually know which animal this is referring to and you will get that on the brain wired. So that is about this topic about. So we are actually opening up the Kaboli Gali mountain pass. So this concludes our topics for today. Tomorrow we will be coming with the fresh new topics of Monday. So we will be seeing you again tomorrow on Monday. Thank you and have a nice day.